Hi guys, welcome back to Wayfair, and let's not waste any more time. I hope you enjoy, and let's get into it. Did I can fall silent? The tip of his tongue pressed against his upper lip. You, you're not from the Oscar family, he says. You shrug, the name's not familiar. No, Draken nearly chokes. Then who? How about let's take this conversation elsewhere, yeah? Aaron interrupts, striding across the room. Looks like your staff could use a break. I don't, ignoring Draken's garbled protest, he seizes the dwarf by the shoulder and pushes him towards the back of the room and up a carpeted staircase. Draken's boys collectively breathe out of a sigh of relief. He rushed by them to follow Aaron up the stairs. You emerge into the same floor and find yourself in a long, narrow hall that runs the length of the building. Door frames are spaced evenly down the hall, their doors removed to reveal the room within. Aaron passes each of them in turn, briefly glancing at the chambers beyond. Some are filled with floor-to-ceiling glass cases, others are lined with books. Some have very few artifacts displayed within, but the displays are sick created by velvet rope and have do not touch signs plastered on every available surface. Aaron finds a room with a door near the end of the hall. He opens it and letting a satisfied sigh steers Drake in through the entryway. Unlike the floor below, the curtains here are pulled back and the windows open to a violet gray light of the rainy day beyond. The walls are plain of dark glossy wood decorated with a handful of paintings depicted Arsenian landscapes. Plush chairs are strewn throughout the room and groups around low round tables. The upholstery is faded and frayed. There are scratches on the tables and the rug in the center is worn and thin. There are no displays here aside from a strange little idol hung high on the wall. The idol is made from some kind of burnished metal and forms what looks like a baby bo baby's body with an oversized wobbly wood head and wide googling eyes that move every few seconds. That is kind of gross. Aaron ushers Drakean into a chair by the window and throws himself into the chair opposite. Drakean rests his hands on his knees, his eyes darting nervously around the room. He glances at the door. You pull it shut. Drakean deflates. Nice place you got here, Lars, Aaron says, leaning back in the chair and putting his feet up on the table. The dwarf bristles, eyeing Aaron, Aaron's boots, but his free primitive dies before it even begins. The dwarf bristles, eyeing Aaron's boots, but his free primitive dies before it even begins. He exhales slowly and tries to ignore you as you make your way across the room and sit down in a chair next to Aaron. I take some manner of pride in it, Larry Kane says slowly. May I ask what has brought two um, fine representatives of the guild to my estab little establishment? You nearly choke. The guild? Trey Kane glances at you. Of course, he says, shaking a little. His, he fiddles with his rings, twisting it around and around his fingers. Runes and relics boast nothing but the highest security. Only those I invited into the establishment may pass through the barrier, or those who exhibit great power, like yourself. He looks from you to Aaron and back again. Aaron raises an eyebrow and draws an arrow from his quiver. He places it on the table, the Alasar's arrowhead shining white against the dark wood. We're wayfarers, Drake says hollowly. You found us out? Aaron says. He leans back in his chair, casually linking his hand behind his neck as he watches Drake hand with a careful eye. The door strokes his manicured beard, his eyes flickering from your weapons to the door to the window as he desperately tries to maintain a calm dip disposition. He's not doing a very good job of it. What, what do you want? He asks, voice quivering. I glance at Aaron. He is a particular way of handling people like Lars Drake and, and from the looks of it, he's already embracing his usual strategy. Casual intimidation, act unruffled, treat the space like your own, and lace that friendly banter with the threat of immediate violence. It's the exact kind of strategy Brissa Varen despised with every ounce of her being. No, I'm gonna cut in. Let's not waste each other's time, he said, cutting across Aaron. Tell us about the chalice, Lars. 
Drake hand freezes. Do what? He squeaks. You rise from your seat, one hand on the hilt of your sword. You know what I'm talking about, you say, rounding the table. Drakehan trembles with fear as you approach and compulsively twists a ring around and around his finger. I, I don't, I, I don't know what you're talking about, I swear. Oh, come on, you snap, looming over his chair. You must see a lot of interesting artifacts pass through your shop, unless you're a scam peddling fraudulent items to those who don't know any better. He shrinks further into his chair. There is nothing deceitful about my collection, I assure you, he says. My clients are already satisfied with the range of antiquities of a sort. And you know what would make me satisfied, Lars? You crouch next to his chair so that you're on the same level and grab him by the front of the shirt. The man stinks of perfume or else. If you could shake that little memory of yours and tell me what you know about a little unadorned copper chalice. Oh, Draken says, that chalice? He coughs nervously. You tighten your grip and his eyes widen. Ashira, Aaron Myers, you ignore him. Yes, you tell Drakehand, that chalice. It wasn't anything special, he exclaims. Just a little thing out of my virus found on a return ship from the Calithian coast. It arrived on a ship, bursting with more interesting items. It was nothing compared to the other we imported that month. He pauses, catching his breath, and passes on. I don't know Kelly and wanted it so badly, but the time I got this massive missive, the Count's mercenary and that damn green blood blinder arrived and threatened to burn the shop down if I didn't give it to them. Aaron draws back, shifting uncomfortably in his seat, a strange look on his face. A blood binder? he asks quietly. Drakehan stares at the floor. Now look, he curses. You must not have heard Aaron's question. I don't know who you work for, but if you're going to slit my throat, please do it already. I'd rather die here than be fine by Oscar's family. You sigh really. Good news for you, then. You say, releasing him. We work for the Count, and it doesn't want you dead. Not yet, anyways. The dwarf stares at you in shock, mouth working fiercely to hide his fear. He nods, then slumps forward into feet, head in his hands. You sigh wearily and step away. Though he is responsible for bringing the chalice into ruin, it seems his involvement stops there. It's not the most useful information. Listen, Drakehan, you say, folding your arms. The only reason we're here is because the chalice is missing. You took it from Calinthia, and the Count took it from you, and now someone has taken it from the Count. Clearly, it's an item of interest to many. Who in the city would want to take it? Doubt Hurricane cringes. I don't know. Best guess? I don't know! He wrings his hand, twisting a ring around and around, and a gemstone pops free from its setting. It clatters across the floor and rolls under a chair. The furry Indian lady. She's on the list. Guess again? Then try any of the seven. You work for the Count. You know better than me who his enemies are. Think outside a box, little you press. He'll have said the seven. Only merchants, proprietors in the cove, some. No one on the street would dare. Drake and jokes. Not unless they had the backing to counter Serenolos. That she had death, perhaps. Aaron gets to his feet, a deep scowl darkening his brow. The local guildmaster? Come on, Drakehan. That's my best guess, the dwarf exclaims, raising his hands and cowering in his chair. It's all I know. I'm sorry. Drakehan peeks at you through the gap in his fingers. You do? You glance at Aaron. He sighs witherly. With that, you turn around and stride across the room, winding your way through the tables and chairs. Drake can stares at you, Thomas Stark frozen in his chair. You reach the center of the room and pause. The idol watches you gleefully from the corner of the eye. Your gut twists. You really hate that thing. The dwarf hangs his head. A fair and good luck charm. He mumbles attends to the owner. 
makes them well lucky. I'm not sure if it works. I've had terrible luck playing around cards in this room. Huh? We're gonna take it off his hands. You cross the room and pluck the idol from the wall, ignoring Drake hands for tests. You turn it over in your hands. The burnished metal is cool and smooth. You don't see anything immediately magical about it, but then you sense the pulsing of a blinding spot buried deep within its center. Away from your touch, it is enchanted, but you're not sure if it does what Drakean thinks it does. I'll take this off your hands, if you don't mind, you say, and stuff the idol in your pocket. Please, Drakean groans, a hand pressed to his forehead. Leave me alone. Happily, you reply. Come on, Aaron. It's still raining when you return to the street. Well, that was a waste of time, you say, shutting the shop's door. You hover on the front steps and scowl at the gray sky. Aaron grunts. You look up and down the street. You should continue with your investigation, considering Drake Hand didn't give you much. Though your funds are scanty and there isn't much you can afford, maybe you can talk your way into a deal. What do you think? You ask, cluttering down the steps and into the boardwalk to join the milling crowds. Should we stop, stop for supplies? Might find something useful. Sure, he grimaces, his brow furrowing. No, I don't. Mm. He stops and exhales a long, sharp breath. Whatever you want, Ashira. You pause. Someone smacks into your arm and curses at you as they hurry down the road. You brush him off and seize Aaron by the elbow, dragging him to the side. What's going on? You ask. His mouth twitches. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. He says, folding his arms and glancing back at runes and relics. Looks like you won the bet. Okay, looks like we're going to take the second one. You owe me a favor, you reply, grinning, and I'm not going to waste it now. Better prepare yourself. I could spring it on you whenever I want. I'll keep that in mind. He stuffs his hand into his pockets and gets shirred at the streets. So, where did you want to go? You consider your option. There's an apothecary where you might find poultices and poisons. The artificer will have gadgets from lockpicks to traps to any number of things, and that the blacksmith could have a useful tool you won't find anywhere else, provided you didn't get him to talk to you. I'm all for resupplying, Aaron adds, but we've already wasted a lot of time here. Let's try not to visit the same place twice, yeah? You nod. He's right. You really only have time to visit each location once. You have five crowns. Where do you want to go? You and Aaron follow the boardwalk, winding your way to the very end. You're close to the coast here. The smell of fish and brine is strong, and the planks creak beneath your feet. If you stepped off the boardwalk, you could step directly into the sea. The apothecary shop is small and clings to the edge of the boardwalk. Only one story tall and sporting a thatched roof, it looks like a hut and a shop. In contrast to the other shops in the cove, the apothecary veranda is lit with lamps rather than conjured lights. You've always had a fondness for this place. It's nice to walk into a shop and know you can't destroy its infrastructure simply by existing. Stepping up into the veranda, you slide the door open and enter. The shop is empty and dark. The only source of light is a small oil lamp strung from the rafters, hanging alongside suspended pots overflowing with spindly green plants and vines. The floor, though scratched and creaking, is always clean of dirt and mud. The walls are lined shelves with wood darkening with age. They are filled with earthenware jars and glass bottles, all neatly placed in a row, each one meticulous meticulously labeled with a delicate script. At the far back, in a small counter, the apothecary, a middle-aged Ada, leans against it, absorbed writing labels and attached them to new stock. They look up as you approach, their face brightening. Mashia! Aaron! They say, putting down their quill and pushing their wire spectacles up their nose. Their left wing drapes over their shoulder, gray feathers sleek and orderly, their right wing, the broken one, curls behind their back, out of sight. What can I do for you? 
Good to see you, Amari, he replies, smiling brightly. The apothecary has a long-standing soft spot for you and Aaron. You're not sure why they knew you were wayfarers from the moment you first walked through their door. Maybe they feel some kind of unexplained kinship with you. We don't have a lot, but we're trying to resupply, you continue. Is there anything you can give us for five crowns? Amari exhales slowly, a flickering of guilt crossing their face. I'm sorry, Shira, they say. Were it any other week, I would, but I have my own debts to pay. You nod and press your lips together. Aaron grimaces and moves toward the door, but you don't budge. Amara's infusion and pull juices have proven useful countless times. There must be something you can offer them. I think I'll just think of it. Walk away. You smile shortly. I understand, you say. Thanks, anyways. As you turn to weave your way back to the shop, a strong hand seizes your arm. You glance over your shoulder to find Amara leaning over the counter, an intense look in her eyes. I know you wouldn't willingly work for Siri Nolos unless you had a choice, they say. Please, whatever you're doing, Ashira, be careful. You nod. Amari lets go and withdraws behind the counter. Suddenly, they raise a hand, gesturing creatively in dark blue. When they resurface, they place three files on the countertop. Dark liquid swirl within. For you, they say as you pick up the files and examine them. Infusion of snake wheat. Deadly in large doses. Be careful with it. It's potent. You nod your thanks and slip the files into your pocket. Thank you, Amari. After saying a brief farewell, you leave the shop and step back out into the boardwalk. You have five crowns. Where would you like to go? Let's go to the blacksmith.